Hi everyone and welcome to the latest monologue. This one will be uh, very heavy on history because I've found that we really need to look into background and it's something where not just in Kenya but many parts of the world people suffer from the inability to perceive history or or even the desire to read history because they have this paradigm that that is the past and we don't need to worry about it and now we are looking towards the future you you keep hearing this nonsense of people saying this and that is the future this and that is the future um the past is the context for the future so if you don't have a grip on the past your grip on the future is is, is absolutely useless so there was an article in one of the local dailies on 4th of April and it was saying that um, it said that conservancies are making men old men rich at the expense of the youth and and women folk and so many people shared this with me because part of it sort of resonated with with things i have said in the past but um most people who shared it with me hadn't didn't look into the history so or aren't aware of the history so i'd like to go back into the history of conservation we need to understand that what is practiced in our countries as conservation today is about supremacy and control that was its origin um the west's interest in our wildlife has never been out of love for animals after all they're the people who kill animals for sport it has been out of the need to control our lands the lands on which these animals live the resources on which these animals depend and 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 uh, before anyone argues against that because many can't perceive that africans are not immigrants from any place we are indigenous to this continent and we are we are in we are completely attached to our land where we come from um people have many other different terms where you come from where your umbilical cord is buried etc etc but there's a deep spiritual attachment to land once you take land from an african he's finished he's spiritually stunted he's is completely disabled and that is why the west is so in love with the so called um westernized or progressive africans who are happy to live in a flat and who follow western western trends in this that the other and and don't w- have no attachment intellectual or otherwise to natural resources and that's that's and 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 that's what the west loves the middle class african whose attachment to our wildlife is as a tourist so he gets in a vehicle like a western tourist and goes out to those places where it's called nature and they see wildlife so that's the history conservation is about dominion now that we are there i'd like to take us back to the late 19th century the colonialists introduced rinderpest to africa rinderpest is its cattle disease devastating cattle disease whether or not it was deliberate is unclear but the truth of the matter is that this devastated herds of livestock right across the continent and its impact on on the populations of the pastoralists who owned those livestock was devastating as well probably even worse because it introduced famine etc it reduced their food security political power wealth etc and it 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 loosened their grip on many of their lands as you see the g- livestock is the glue that holds pastoralists to their lands so fast forward then um this so rinder pest basically really helped the colonialists because it disempowered so many of the people who are who are who are probably the strongest in resisting their overtures in in terms of religion commerce and western ideas um masai land was was very difficult for them um because the masai had wealth why we, the few of them could understand or countenance why he should go and work for some stranger for a few papers or coins and he's got his herd of livestock there in the wealth so fast forward 1951 an organization was called was formed in 1951 called the Inter- inter-african bureau for epizootic diseases this was to study the impacts of this rinderpest and probably and probably see how to control it 
and look at the impacts on societies. Remember, this was 1951, and then and then first first f f later on, this became what is called the Organization of African Unity (OAU), which was precursor for to the African Union, the Inter 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 African Bureau for Animal Resources, and then. But this this brings into us into, brings us to a serious question: How come this thing became part of the OAU? Yet it was formed in 1951 before any African nation became independent. That is the question because now this was a very important office because it controlled it controlled or, or sought to study a very important part of African life, the livestock and the 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 livestock and the attachment to rangelands and the power of pastoralist people. So anyway, after after OAU was founded in 1963, somehow the colonialists in, inserted this organization of theirs into the OAU. And then they even built they, they even ended up headquartering it in the in the in the most imperialist uh, leaning country in Africa, Kenya. It's, it's headquarters is on Museum Hill. It's a place called Kenindia Plaza. And then the strange thing, if you look at this this organ, this uh, uh, African Union International Bureau for Ab Animal Resources, their projects include even things of human health. So this brings up the white supremacist aspect of looking at African people outside their humanity, looking at them as part of ecosystems and part of the resources. It's a very Western, it's a very Western uh, pattern of thought. But the, the, interest, the other interesting thing is that the investors in this were Swe Swedish government through CEDA, Agence uh, Francaise de Développement from France, UK aid from the UK, US aid from the US, Danida from Denmark, UNDP Global Environment Facility, and then there's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well. It's one of the, the more recent additions. And that, that, that organization instantly raises suspicion in, in my mind in terms of anything they're involved in because they're, main, they're, they're an agent of repression of African people through roundabout means. But then this, this was founded. So this shows that the, the link, the interest was not in improving the animal resources or livestock resources. It was in managing how much power accrues to the people from the animal resources in Africa. So then later on, in 1994, an organization called ILRI was formed. It's International Livestock Research Institute. Again, an agreement between government of Kenya, Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland, Ethiopia, and again, UNEP. United Nations Environment Program. It's, it, so it wasn't about food. This is about a control of environment. If it was about food, it would have been the FAO would be the branch of the of the UN that they would be that they would be affiliated with. But it wasn't about our food or our food security. It's about environment and control thereof. Now, when we come to Ilri, this has been doing research on on livestock in Africa, in 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 Afri Kenya and other African countries since 1994 and again it's based in Kenya the imperialist playground in Africa now Ilri Ilri's research has been on maintaining very detailed databases on on animal resources and wealth in in Kenya and other parts of Africa they're very detailed databases even on population of chicken in Kenya something that detailed and they they've kept concentrating on environment not improving our livestock not improving our production chains or marketing chains etc you never hear that from Hillary. you hear all these things about population of people population of pastoralists population of of livestock and all that but never in the context of trying to improve it but in the context of a threat to environment now they had a st statistician sometime in the past um um, this is this is th this brings me back to the article of April fourth, twenty twenty fourth, twenty twenty four. It's by one jo Dr. Joseph Ogutu. He's a statistician at University of Hohenheim in Germany, and 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 
and he's the one who wrote who wrote about this so he's a mathematician i'm not sure why he how he came to to write about these social issues but it raised an alarm bell and i'm going to tell you why because he used to work for ilri and while at ilri again he collected numbers a lot of extrapolation of data from various people non scientific data from various people over the years and came up with very alarmist article in around 2010 2009-2010 that Masai Mara had lost 70% of its wildlife in about 35 years or something. Some some crazy figure like that and had lost even 95% of its giraffe in that period. So this spread panic and uh, the same article raised the alarm that there's too much livestock in the Mara area. Remember, this is someone working for Livestock Research Institute raising an alarm about numbers of livestock yet they should be strengthening the livestock production chains. So this article was bandied about a lot. And at the same time, Ilri, Ilri recruited, recruited science communicators or community people amongst pastoralist communities then. And these people helped push this message along. So again, one of the leading lights or, 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 or scientists in, in, in Ilri then Dr. Dr. Robin Reed, again, was turned out to be someone who was more 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 inclined towards towards uh, environmental issues or conservation than livestock production. And I knew this because because I met her when she teaches at Colorado State University, and I met her during my teaching stint there a few years ago. And and in her writings are about conservation and, and about concern over numbers of livestock, concern over pastoralists, but never concern over productivity of lives of um, the livestock and and uh, the pro product and the, the the strength of the pastoralist production chain. Now we end up here now with a, with an organization that is meant to be researching on livestock, but is actually researching on how to manage manage negatively the the livestock production systems and the power that comes from them so 2010 ilri another paper comes out of ilri that's saying that the again by ogutu um that there are too many too many tourists too many tourists coming to the mara and tourists are, and and this is a danger to the mara because also because the of the pressure from pastoralists so there's too many people around now again this this was not a, a livestock inclined inclined sort of um, article and and at the same time that's when they came up with the 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 proposed mara management plan i was familiar with this because i was i was a trust manager at kenya wildlife trust that was one of the organizations supporting it and all all the plans i can share that they were around restricting act access of people to the Mara, down to even restricting the colors of cars that can be allowed into the Mara. Having a core area that charges 100 US dollars per person, regardless of, of whether you're local or, or, or foreign or whatever. And it was a terrible plan because it was going to retain exclusivity of the Mara to a very high end. It was not about improving the Mara, it was about retaining control. And this is what conservation is about. It's about retaining control. So this anyway this this didn't happen later on they, there's a recent iteration of the the Mara management plan that has come through that is probably not as bad as that original one but then after that then the idea of conservancies was came out of these ruminations at at Ilri and then they pushed the idea and then a meeting was held to form the conservancies, Kenya Wildlife Conservancies Association. Again, I was at that meeting, Intercontinental Hotel, I think 2009 or 2010. And these tourist investors went around, went around demanding this particular person to be appointed head of, to be picked head of, head of this thing, because he was their fixer. And I heard them say, we have to have him, we have to have him. Uh, and and we have to have him because he comes from a, a community that quote unquote lives with wildlife where someone comes from is an accident of of birth it, it's 
it's not um, um, uh, it's not something to prevent or make someone eligible for something for for a professional position but anyway it came it came to pass and then later on as we, as we, as we went on these these sentiments built and lies became typical of of conservation science like um, the the idea that el african elephants will be are being killed one every 15 minutes and they'll be extinct in the wild by 2025 this was put up by the sheldrick wildlife trust i'm still waiting for next year f to ask them wh where how come there are still elephants running around but lies became lies became an accepted method of advancing the anti indigenous people message of conservation and we we as highly qualified scientists became the face of these these lies particularly the black scientists because because obviously white supremacy is is much easier to accept when it's spoken by a black face now we come we come to the present when this article came out in the nation this one that came out april 24th 2024 I instantly knew something's afoot. And then two days later, after they said conservancies are making men, men, uh, old men rich and impoverishing the youth and women, Kenya Wildlife Conservancies Association comes out with a gender equity guide for conservancies. And that the time just comes in, comes in immediately, realize that this is a choreographed thing. Conservancies are the hotbed of of uh, of uh, sexism and exclusion of women because typically NGOs come in and identify elders all of whom are men and they get these old men to sign these agreements handing over their whole community's land for decades and then the women these same these same NGOs are the ones who come and put the women into useless activities like beadwork that ensure they remain busy under an illusion of having an income generating activity. But they're the, the ones behind the fracturing of this society between the youth, the youth who have to graze animals, who now have to go further and further to graze animals because their elders have given away the best grazing land for conservation. Not for conservation, for tourism or carbon trading, etc. So we cannot have gender equity guide from the people who are working against gender equity. This is the falsehood that lies in, in, this, in this whole thing. But it's so choreographed, and our people have bought it so completely that it's very hard to get, it's very hard to get people to think clearly about this. And, and, and just to, to, to complete the circle, Joseph Ogutu, the former Ilri, Ilri scientist, is the one who wrote the, the, the article about conservancies enriching men. The, the former Ilri community officer is now the CEO of Kenya Wildlife Service uh, Conservancies Association. So we can see the connection. This is why it's important to read history. And the fact is, we cannot we cannot understand or deal with conservation and have any conservation direction until we understand that what we are practicing now originates from the need of imperialism or foreigners to control our resources. It has nothing to do with the wildlife. Its origins have nothing to do with the wildlife. In fact, their interest in the wildlife when they landed in Africa was how many they could kill, how big an elephant can you kill, um, how big a lion can you kill, can you kill a leopard. It was all about killing. The interest was all about killing. Even now the interest um, extends to capturing capturing them, putting them in zoos, making money, money from them, putting fences around them, and taking the land that is purported to, to form habitats for this wildlife. So we have to think about that. And my people, particularly Kenyans, we love ignorance. We have the gift of ignorance. Kenya is the only place where people will tell you, when you think about something, they tell you you are overthinking. I've never heard that word anywhere outside Kenya. 
um when someone opposes is troubled by something you say he said he says i don't see what you are talking your percep that's a fact of your perception if you don't see it, it might mean you are blind it doesn't mean what i'm talking about doesn't exist but we must remove this cloak of ignorance that is so comfortable to us and ra goes right across our society we must think about things we must read history you must understand history regardless what industry you're working if you are in education look at the history of education in banking look at history of banking then you'll understand and have some hope for the future please feel free to listen to this a number of times because it's not a simple podcast um monologue it's probably the most complicated one but take time to understand why these organizations exist what's this research that's being done here and what is the aim of it thank you there's some food for thought <laughs>